In this lecture we're going to look at ultrasound of an abdominal ultrasound. Now we are going to cover, to start with anatomy. This is important and I think ultrasound helps you understand in sort of that three dimension in your anatomy and some important parts in anatomy which can cause problems for us which are relevant no matter what imaging modality you're working with. We are going to talk about um, what we scan, what structures we scan, normal measurements, but it's really not relevant whether I take one image of the pancreas or whether I document three images of the pancreas. What's important is that everyone will document the pancreas. So please don't get worried about how many pictures should you be taking. That'll vary from site to site. Um, the important thing is that we're looking at all the structures. So no matter where you go to work, um, the structures that we look at, the normal measurement ranges for scanning the abdomen will be the same. Just to start with, let's look at some of the common reasons why a person might be sent for an abdominal ultrasound. And these aren't all of them, but these are the most common ones. And the first one is abdominal pain or specifically right upper quadrant pain. And what we're thinking of here, if a patient has right upper quadrant pain, is that they have gallstones or stones within their gallbladder. Often um, this right upper quadrant pain can mimic as if they're having a heart attack, so it can be chest pain and sort of radiate to the shoulder and things like that as well. So often these people will have been to the emergency department thinking they're having a heart attack, their heart tests have come back normal and then they'll send them off for an abdominal ultrasound scan. The reason being that they're thinking the patient has gallstones. Anything to do with the digestive system, nausea and vomiting, while ultrasound is pretty much useless for looking at um, stomach and the bowel because it's usually full of gas and the gas just scatters the sound wave, what we're looking for are the other organs that we can see well and do they look normal or can we see any obvious big large masses. So occasionally you might find uh, say a mass in a bowel or something like that. Now, LFTs, abnormal LFTs, LFTs stands for liver function tests. So it's very common for GPs if they want to check how a person is, just to run some basic tests of the blood. And one of the tests that they will do is to check commonly the liver function. And often, because the liver look, processes so many things and does so many jobs within the body, Often these liver function can be off a little bit. So if it comes back in the bloods that the liver function tests are abnormal, often their first test that they'll do is an abdominal ultrasound to see what the liver looks like. The liver, because it does have so many um, functions and filters the blood, it is also a common site for cancer spread. So a lot of primary cancers metastasize to the liver. So often um, people who have had cancer in the past will have routine 6-12 monthly abdominal ultrasound scans just to look at the liver and make sure that it's looking alright. Now you've all probably heard of abdominal aortic aneurysms or triple A's. Um, so some people when they feel their tummy they can have a very pulsatile um, aorta. And in that case, we might be worried that um, the aorta has dilated out. Also, sometimes the GPs and doctors can listen to the aorta. And if they hear with their stethoscope a high pitch swish sound in the area of the aorta, that's referred to as an abdominal brewy. And this is often um, an indication that there could be an aneurysm present, um, that they're hearing the high pitch um, blood moving through the aneurysm part. So if they hear this abdominal brewing, which is a high pitch sound when they're listening to the aorta, they'll send the patient for a quick look at the aorta with ultrasound to start with. Now a jaundice patient is a patient who has a yellow tone to them. It often affects the skin and the white, the sclera of the eyes that will go a yellowy tinge as well. And you probably have seen people um, in, when you've been out on placement with jaundice. 
If they've got jaundice, what it is, is it's an accumulation of bilirubin within the bloodstream. Now the, the liver filters bilirubin out of the blood and sends it down the bile ducts to be concentrated into the gallbladder. And then when we eat, the gallbladder contracts and sends um, the bile down to the duodenum. So if a patient is jaundice, that whole system is not working. So somewhere in that system, there is a blockage. And ultrasound is really the modality of choice in a patient who has jaundice to, to find that initial cause. Is it, um, is there something going on in the liver? Is there something going on in the ducts? Or is there something going on in the gallbladder? People can have enlarged livers or spleen. Um, so um, if this happens, the doctor might be palpating the abdomen and feel that um, the liver and spleen are enlarged. Again, a quick look with the ultrasound will determine what these structures are. We'll measure them um, and, and look if there's anything growing within them and that's enlarging them. Now, unfortunately, alcoholics, um, it, it affects their liver is the big thing, particularly if they're doing an awful lot of drinking. Now the liver has the ability to forgive up to a point. So if they're over drinking and we can get them to reduce their drinking or completely reform, the liver will um, improve and get better and function and they'll feel much better. However, there does become a point where the damage to the liver is not reversible. And at that stage, any change in their drinking will not help their liver. And then that will have other problems within the body as well. So we do do a lot of abdomens on alcoholics and particularly alcoholics who are trying to reform and reduce their level of drinking. High cholesterol, we hear a lot about high cholesterol these um, days. It is something that's checked in the blood tests and with the liver function tests often. Um, it will come back in the bloods so that their cholesterol is high. So they'll be sent off for an ultrasound to check the abdomen and make sure everything looks all right. But the main thing they're interested in is what does the liver look like? And because the liver can filter out the increased fat within the blood and store it within the liver and then the liver won't function properly. So in high cholesterol, we're also very concerned about the liver. In polycystic disease, um, this is usually a genetic disease. Uh, the patients will know a lot about more about the disease than we do because often their other mem family members have been through it and they'll know very much about their condition and what stage they're at. The ki kidneys are the most commonly affected. However, you can get cysts in other areas like ovaries and liver and spleen. The kidneys in particular will become extremely large because they've got lots of multiple cysts. And so it's about looking how many cysts are there, what size is the kidney and have we got any normal kidney tissue left. Now ascites just means free fluid within the abdomen. So these patients' abdomens are often very dilated and distended. They're often cancer patients. Um, and in sort of end stage cancer, unfortunately, you can get a lot of ascites or fluid. We can be used to drain the fluid off, show that the needle's going into the peritoneal cavity and say not into the bowel or an organ and that they're draining and getting all the fluid off. The problem is it will reaccumulate. So it can accumulate within the abdomen and also within the chest cavity as well is very common. Um, but again, a quick look to see what's going on in the abdomen, where this fluid is pooling, and we might use the ultrasound to guide the drainage. All right, so let's start with our anatomy. And I know you've done a lot of anatomy, but I just want to point out quickly um, some important things for when we're scanning. 
So obviously we've got our liver, which is extremely large, sits in the right upper quadrant and the rib cage is basically there to protect it. Um, so when the doctor's feeling around, if it's extending below the rib cage, they tend to go, oh, well, your liver could be a little bit enlarged. Now we do measure the liver and we measure in the mid hepatic line, so right in the middle of the liver. And for us in ultrasound to call it normal, it, that measurement should be less than 15 and a half centimetres. If it's over 15 and a half centimetres, then we're going to say that the liver is enlarged. Now, we need to be very aware in ultrasound of variants of normal anatomy. So a variant of normal anatomy for the liver is a thing called the Rydell's low. And this is like, um, it looks like a tongue has been attached to the bottom of the liver. And this tongue extends, we can extend right down into the pelvis of these people. Um, it is a normal variant of, no of normal anatomy and we wouldn't call a liver with a Rydell's lobe an enlarged liver. So it's just something that we need to keep in mind actually exists. Now we can separate the liver into right and left lobes and the chordate lobe and we also um, separate the liver into more segments. So if we're looking at a mass in a particular area in the liver, we will actually say which segment of the liver that um, the mass is so that when we come to follow it up in 6-12 months time, we know that we're looking at the same uh, mass. Now, I'm not going to read out all of the functions. Um, you can have a quick look over this, but just so that you know that the liver is an extremely important organ within our body. It does an awful lot of things to keep us healthy and to detoxify the blood. If we don't look after our liver, we're going to feel like crap, basically. And it's amazing the people whose liver's not functioning well, who then reform whatever it is that's causing the liver not to function well and they come back for a scan and the liver's improved they say how much better they feel they're not as tired and lethargic they've got more energy and they, they look better their skin's better um, so just remember that the liver is very important um, very important for everything in our body and have everything working well so we need to look after it now the gallbladder is just basically a sac it's a storage sack. We can live without it if we need to. So if it does get sick, you can have it taken out and you miss it a little bit, but not greatly. We say that it's roughly pear shaped um, and just sits on the surface of the liver and it's quite um, anterior and superficial. So it's not too deep within the body. And basically it's just a sac that the bile is stored in. And then when we eat, and we eat the bile, gallbladder contracts and sends that bile down into the second part of the duodenum. And the role of bile, even though it's a waste product that the body and the liver is getting rid of, the bile actually breaks down the fats within our foods. So people who have their gallbladder out just have the bile trickling down the duct into the second part of the duodenum constantly rather than getting that sort of squeeze and flush of bile coming down when they eat. So often once the gallbladder has been removed people find that they can't eat fatty meals so well or they end up feeling really yuck after a fatty meal because their body can't digest it quite so well. So it's about a lifestyle change um, and eating non-fatty foods and then you won't notice that your gallbladder has disappeared at all. So just think of your gallbladder as a big empty storage sack. Now, the bile ducts. We don't see a lot of the bile ducts unless there's something wrong with them. So the, the, body, uh, the liver filters out the bilirubin from the body and it comes into all the little bile ducts within the liver. So there's lots of tiny little ones within the liver and then they all join up to form your right and left hepatic ducts. The right and left hepatic ducts actually then exit the liver and join together. And when they join together, we change the name of them to the common hepatic duct because the two have now joined. Then what happens is the cystic duct, which comes from the gallbladder, joins that common hepatic duct, 
and then we change the name of the duct again to the common bile duct. So remember it's just the same duct, we're just changing its name. Now what's important about this common bile duct that we need to know is that the common bile duct actually ducts in behind the head of the pancreas. It e enters then the second part of the duodenum which is where then the bile comes out to emulsify the fats within the foods that we've eaten. What sometimes then, and again it can be a variant of normal, is in most people the pancreatic duct joins the common bile duct before the um, duct enters the second part of the duodenum. Now in some people the pancreatic duct won't, it will enter on its own and sometimes some people will have two pancreatic ducts. One will enter the second part of the duodenum on its own, the other one will, will join the common bile duct and then enter the second part of the duodenum. So again, there are variations of normal anatomy that can happen that we need to be aware of. Now, the thing, the big thing about this anatomy is this gallbladder um, common bile duct going behind the head of the pancreas. When the duct goes behind the head of the pancreas, we cannot see it on ultrasound. So we can clear a duct down to the head of the pancreas, but we can't clear it from the head of the pancreas to the second part of the duodenum. So often, if I can't see anything, but I've got dilated up ducts and maybe a joindus patient, then I'm going to say I can't see it, but I know there's something going on in the duct in that head of pancreas area, and then they'll have to go and have a CT of that area done. So very important that not only do we know what we can see, but also what we can't see, and therefore what further need to be done. Now, in the abdomen, we know, we've all heard of the peritoneum, so we've got the parietal peritoneum and then the visceral peritoneum. And think of that as just glad wrap lining um, the abdominal cavity and lining the organs. So there's um, two main organs in the abdomen that are what we refer to as retroperitoneal, meaning that they're only covered by peritoneum on the anterior surface, so they're not completely wrapped in the peritoneum. And one of these organs is the pancreas. Pancreas is sort of long and skinny and basically goes from your right to your um, left side and we divide it into a head, body and tail. When we scan, it's often very hard to see the pancreas because anterior to the pancreas is the stomach. So if the stomach's got food in it or if it's full of gas, the person's been gulping air and um, they're stomach's full of gas then seeing the pancreas is really hard and often you might be able to see the say the head all right but you can't see the body and the tail so again when we're scanning we have to just say you know head seen well body and tail not seen or head and body seen well tail not seen and then if they're worried about that in the patient then again they have to go to the next test which obviously would most likely be a CT scan now again, pancreas is very, very important. We can't live without it and it has two main functions um, and endocrine, which is a hormone um, function and exocrine, which is your pancreatic juice, which has um, digestive function. So just a quick schematic out of a textbook for us to um, see this. So here's um, the left lobe of, the, oh, hold on, I've got to do my, get my point right. Here's our left lobe of the liver. Here's our falciform ligament and you will see that. It will be echogenic. It'll only be thin but you'll see it. And then we come into our right lobe of the liver. Now the gallbladder and the bile ducts um, they often denote as being green. So I don't know any of you have seen people who might have a small bowel obstruction and if they're vomiting up, what you'll often find is that vomit looks green, a greeny blacky colour because what they're vomiting up is the bile and that's why the gallbladder um, and bile ducts are often denoted green because bile is a greeny blacky colour. Here's the duodenum which has two parts. To the first 
here's the second part down here and the third part, forming a C shape around our head of our pancreas. So we've got a big head, then the body, and it thins down to the tail here, and the spleen would be out on the side just here. Sometimes you see the pancreatic duct, sometimes you don't. If you see it, we measure it. As I said, this one actually has um, a few <laughs> pancreatic ducts. You can see one's entering on its own, um, but it's general in the most people that the pancreatic duct joins the common bile duct and then they enter the second part of the duodenum just here. Alright, now spleen, much smaller than the liver, lies on the le in the left upper quadrant. So it's really the on the balance of the other side to the liver, the balance of the liver, but it is much smaller than the liver. And again, the rib cage is there to protect um, the spleen. So if we've got ribs broken in this area, we can get very worried about the patient's spleen. Reason the spleen is such a worry, particularly in trauma patients, is you'll see down the bottom of the slide here that it's everything's about blood, red blood cells and, and blood. So it's an extremely vascular organ and can bleed and our patients can, their condition, if they've got um, a badly ruptured spleen, they can go into shock and deteriorate quite quickly on us. And it's something that they'll often rush um, a trauma patient to theatre for to remove their spleen um, so they can control the bleeding. So for us it looks C shaped, so it looks like a C. Um, we measure it and its length should be um, less than the 12 centimetres. If we measure it and it's greater than 12 centimetres, we actually calculate the volume of splenic tissue that's present. Of course, it could be a skinny, long spleen rather than a long, fat spleen. So when we do our measurement volume of splenic tissue, we should have less than 300 cubic centimetres of tissue. If we have over that, then we're going to say we have an enlarged spleen, which is referred to as splenomegaly. Now, the kidneys are the second organs in the abdomen that are retroperitoneal. So we've got retroperitoneal pancreas and retroperitoneal kidneys. And the majority of people have two kidneys. That obviously you already know can have variations of normal anatomy as well. Some people have one, some people have three, some people you can have up to six, I believe, in the process of dividing. But for the average person, general, most common, most people have um, two kidneys and they're covered with the peritoneum just on the anterior surface. So we divide the kidney into the outer cortex the inner medulla, and then where the cortex has a break in the middle is the hilum or hilus of the kidney. And that's where your arteries and veins and nerves and the ureter all enter and exit in the hilum or hilus of the kidney. And in an adult, um, where it depends roughly on the size of the person, obviously the larger, the taller um, the person, the larger their organs are going to be. Um, where the shorter and sort of smaller the person, the smaller they'll be, but usually in the nine to 12 centimeters when we're measuring the length um, of the kidneys. Kidney is very important. You can live with just one if one has to be taken out for some reason. Um, but they also detoxify um, the blood and have a large role in regulating our blood pressure as well. So often you'll get people in with high blood pressure and they'll be asking for a renal or an abdominal ultrasound to look at the kidneys. Um, and that's because the kidneys have a function in blood pressure regulation. Now, the aorta, big large tube, comes from our heart right down our body to basically distribute the blood from the oxygenated blood from the heart to the body. It's something that we look at to make sure that it's not dilated because if it's getting this pounding, pounding, pounding of blood constantly all our life, the walls of the aorta can um, become dilated out. And this sometimes can be a genetic thing as well. So often you'll find if someone in the family is diagnosed 
with an aneurysm of the aorta, they'll be sending all relatives off to have a look and an ultrasound of the aorta because it can be a genetic um, condition. We measure the aorta and so when we do our measurement it should be less than three centimetres and sometimes it'll be less than three centimetres but it will still have a bump or, or a, an aneurysm to it but it, it's not anything that we would worry about, something we would just monitor. Now with age the walls of all of our arteries become what we call ectatic, E-C-T-A-T-I-C, -T -T ectatic which just means that they start to lose their elasticity a little bit after all the years of being pounded. So that means that they can become, uh, instead of straight, a little bit wonky and they can dilate out a little bit. But so long as they're under the three centimetres, we, we don't tend to worry. We'll follow them, might monitor them every six to 12 months, um, but we won't be rushing them into theatre to do anything to to them so it's just normal. So some aneurysms are still within normal limits and will never in a lifetime cause anyone any problems, others will. Okay so now we're going to move on to our patient preparation for an upper abdominal ultrasound and it's very very important that our patients have fasted. And if they don't fast, if they cheat and eat something, we will actually need to rebook them um, so that we can see their abdomen when they have fasted. Diabetic patients, we tend not to want to fast for quite as long as um, a, a normal patient. So we only fast them for four hours and we always book them first thing in the morning in our ultrasound list. Why do we fast them? Firstly, it reduces um, obviously stomach contents and bowel processing so it empties out the stomach allowing us to see the pancreas better um, and the other abdominal structures and reduces the bowel gas which helps us see. And the other main reason is that if they're fasted their gallbladder will be filled with bile and distended. If they haven't fasted and they've eaten, the gallbladder will have contracted to send the bile down to break the food, the fat up in the food that they've eaten. So I need to know, have you fasted? If you've got a contracted gallbladder, I'm going to say you've got a nasty sick gallbladder if you fasted and I'm going to be sending you to theatre to have that gallbladder removed. However, if you haven't fasted and you've just got a bit hungry and you snuck something to eat, um, then your gallbladder has just done the normal thing and contracted so you don't need to go off to theatre um, and have it removed. So often when I see a contracted gallbladder I really do give my patients a hard time in questioning them about did they do the fasting and um, did they not sneak anything and often I'll say to them listen I'm probably going to be sending you to theatre so you need to be honest with me. It doesn't matter if you have eaten uh, but I do need to know because it is important and you'd be amazed at the number of people who then just go Oh, well, yeah, actually I did just have this or that particularly with children. You have to be very careful as well um, And that you do double check that they have followed the fasting procedure and not snuck something while mum was looking the other way so when they come in, we explain the procedure. Hopefully they're in like top and pants or top and skirt so that all you need, you don't need to get them changed. You can just lift their top up, lie them supine on the bed so you're exposing sort of their upper abdomen and often you just have a towel nearby so that you can wipe the gel off. Now for an abdominal scan, we're going to use our curved array transducer. We need that divergent field of view to see the structures nicely. In adults we're going to be using around the three and a half megahertz transducer and if you've got a really thin adult or a child you will be able to use your five megahertz transducer but for the general adult you will not get away with a five megahertz transducer. You just will not see all of the liver well so don't get caught by using that. Right now, now 
we're going to go into our scan technique. And as I said at the beginning, please don't worry about, you know, how many pictures should I take of the pancreas and how many pictures should I take of the order, aorta. What I want you to know is what structures do we look at? What should they look like? And what if measurements we're doing, what measurements um, are normal? So most of us start with the patient's supine and we start scanning the pancreas. Often you'll do this first because after you've got the patient to do a bit of breathing in and holding their breath, you'll tend to find they'll gulp a bit of air and so their stomach will end up with air in it and then you won't see the pancreas. It's also a structure then if you don't see, you can come back to um, later. So you need to show the head, the body and the tail and as we talked about earlier it can sometimes be very hard to show a pancreas in its entirety. If we don't see it in its entirety we don't go yes it's fine, we go I saw this bit and it's fine but I didn't see this bit. So what should it look like? Well the whole lot of it should be nice and homogenous and grey looking. Um, it should, if you go around the borders of it, nice and smooth so nothing sort of jumping or jutting out of your contours and generally speaking you won't see the pancreatic duct but if you do see this tiny little anechoic duct you need to measure it and make sure that it's less than three millimeters if it's greater than three millimeters we're going to say they've got a dilated pancreatic duct and then we have to go looking for well, why is the pancreatic duct um, dilated up now the pancreas is a really hard structure to see on ultrasound, but what we look for is um, anatomy, our landmark anatomy, and it's usually our vessel anatomy. So on this picture here, the A is the aorta, and over here on the side is the IVC. And what they've labelled here, which is really tiny, is the left renal vein heading over to the left kidney. Now, this here is the superior mesenteric artery. Then we, what we have is the portal confluence and the splenic vein. Now this, if you see your portal confluence and your splenic vein, the pancreas sits on the top. So around here is the head, then the body, and then the tail sitting on top of the portal confluence splenic vein. Head, body, tail curled around there. Now the ST that they've got anteriorly is the stomach. So you can see if there's anything in the stomach, it's going to shadow out and we're not going to see what's lying in beneath. Okay, so let's go over that anatomy again. The aorta, the IVC, the left renal vein, the superior mesenteric artery, our portal confluence with our splenic vein, and then our pancreas sits anteriorly to that head, body, tail. So that's the pancreas just in there. We can't see the pancreatic duct on this patient. The ST on the image is the stomach. Now let's come down to this image below. Here's our aorta, here's our IVC. So they're our first two big vascular landmarks. Here's the portal confluence and the splenic vein. And so the pancreas is sitting in here, head, body, and tail. Head, body, and tail. So all of this is the pancreas. And this up here is just a little bit of the liver and we can compare the echogenicity of the liver to the pancreas. And the pancreas is either the same and isoechoic or as in this case, slightly lighter or whiter. So slightly more hyperechoic than the liver and that's normal. So pancreas, it's a hard one, hard one to see. But how do I find it every time I scan? By finding my vascular landmarks. Then what I do is I look at the aorta in longitudinal. Still with my patient nice and supine and you come right up to the xiphoid process and you look at the aorta. This is a bit of the liver 
just here. So you look at the aorta coming down. It should be lovely and anechoic and you should see the hyperechoic wall on the outside and if you watch it as the heart beats you will actually see it pulsate it'll pulsate and you can see that happening so that's the top bit of it then come down to the bottom bit of it and you'll actually see it divide into your right and left common iliacs down here is usually this area down here at the bottom is usually where the majority of aneurysms will occur so you're looking for dilatation or bulges and so this is where we do our measurement and just see so this one is only um, say 1.5 centimeters so less than our three centimeters so it's perfectly normal now with arteries and veins and we don't use this technique for the aorta so much however we do use it if we're trying to discern between arteries and veins say in arms or legs arteries because they have the thick walls and they also have the pressure of the blood within them when you push on them you can compress them a little bit but you know, it's very hard to compress them completely with a vein it will compress very easily so what we say is when we push on a vein, it will wink at you, closes down, and when you take your pressure off, it opens up really quickly. Whereas an archery won't do that. You won't be able to, and you'll be pushing, 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 and going, I can't get this to compress. And that is um, because of the walls and the pressure of the blood inside. So just remember, it is a technique we use um, to discern an artery from a vein, not necessarily the aorta because it's too deep within the body to do that, but definitely when we're looking at arms and legs and limbs. The other thing when we're looking at the aorta is anterior to the aorta in all of us are lymph nodes. We have a big chain of lymph nodes anterior to the aorta. So we always look just anterior to see if we can see any lymph nodes. And sometimes you will, but in the majority of cases you won't. And if we do, then we take pictures of them and we measure them and say what they look like and put the colour on and things like that to show their blood flow. Now, what I do when I'm scanning is I then go over to the left side of the patient. It's purely just how I was taught when I start scanning and that's the habit I'm into. It doesn't matter in which order you look at the organs. Um, so you can now go to the right side and look at the liver, um, but we're going to talk about going then to the left side and we're going to look at the spleen and the left kidney. So to look at that left side, I'm going to roll my patient up onto their right hand side into a right posterior oblique position. It just helps move um, gas and bowel down out of the way, fat down out of the way and gives you good access to the spleen and the kidney and often for the spleen you have to go in between the ribs to see it so it's just an easier position for your scanning. So with the spleen we're looking for the C shape so it should look like here's the spleen here and you can sort of make out it has a C shape to it and we measure it from top to bottom and if it's less than the 12 centimeters then that's all I do. If it's in length greater than the 12 centimeters then I go and do a volume so I measure it from top to bottom from here to here and then I get a transverse image and measure it and calculate the volume of splenic tissue and as I said before if that's less than 300 cubic centimeters it's normal if it's greater than 300 cubic centimeters then we have an enlarged spleen and a condition called splenomegaly this is the left kidney so it sits and is tucked in very close to the spleen so you can see the outer darker cortex and the brighter inner medulla just here So let's talk about the kidneys now. So as I said, I would now go and look at the left kidney, but let's talk about um, both kidneys in general. We look at them in two planes, so longitudinal and transverse. In the transverse plane, the kidney looks round, okay, or roundish, not completely round, but roundish. You will be able to see the break in the cortex, so you will be able to see the hilus or the hilum of the kidney, and you will be able to see arteries, veins, and um, the ureters coming in and out there. 
In the longitudinal, we open up the kidney lengthways, and this is just some bowel gas just here. And you can see we're just missing the end of the kidney just here because of this um, gas. So we do measure the kidney in the longitudinal plane to work out the length. We should have a darker outer cortex, a brighter inner medulla, and when we compare the cortex of the kidney to the liver, they should be isoechoic or the same um, in grey level. Now, so once I've done the spleen and the left kidney, I then roll my patient over onto their left side. So they're now in a left posterior oblique position and I can now concentrate on the right hand side. So coming over to the liver, we must look at the liver, the left lobe and the right lobe in its entirety in two planes. So scan through it in longitudinal and then turn it 90 degrees to that and scan through it in transverse. And we don't have to take 50 million pictures. You tend to just take a series, a few, as you do in long, go through in longitudinal and a few to represent the liver in transverse. Remember in the mid hepatic line, we must measure it and it should be less than 15 and a half centimetres. If it isn't, then we're going to say that the liver is enlarged. We also do some Doppler traces of the portal vein, and this is to show that the blood in the portal vein is coming into the liver to be detoxified. In some conditions, particularly in a very cirrhotic alcoholic liver, the blood in the portal vein, because the liver goes, yeah, I don't want it, um, it's so shrunk and shriveled up, that the blood in the portal vein will actually turn around and head away from the liver, which obviously causes a lot more problems within the abdomen as well that you will see. Um, but our Doppler trace will show, is the blood from in the portal vein coming towards the liver to be detoxified or has the liver gone closing the doors, get out of here and it's reversed and gone the other way. So let's have a look at the pictures. So here is the left lobe of the liver and down here is the caudate lobe and this is the IBC. So left lobe of liver, caudate lobe, IBC. This is the right lobe of the liver in the mid hepatic line. You can see this really echogenic thick structure just here. Oh sorry, I haven't turned the I'll go back and turn my dot on. So left lobe of the liver, caudate lobe of the liver, and IVC just here. This is the right lobe of the liver in the mid hepatic line and we've done our measurement. So this is roughly 12 and a half centimetres, so completely fine, not enlarged. This very bright echogenic structure just here is the diaphragm. Okay, so you often see the diaphragm really clearly. On this picture here, this is the liver and this is the portal vein coming up into the liver. So we've put our Doppler on. There's our little Doppler gate just there sitting in the portal vein and then we get a venous trace. Okay, so in comparison, you can see the difference in this trace to the trace we looked at in the introductory le lecture. This one is just forward, low, slow flow, forward, all the way through, which is a venous. So we're not getting any peaks and troughs on this flow, which is what we expect. It's above the line, so it's flowing into the liver. So perfectly normal. Now, the bar ducts, as I said, if you're seeing them within the liver, there's something wrong. So all we really see is from exiting the liver, which is the common hepatic duct, and then the common bar duct once the cystic duct joins it, and the common bar duct we only see to the head of the pancreas. So just remember, there could be something stuck between the head of the pancreas and the second part of the duodenum, or there could even be a mass in the head of the pancreas that's compressing on the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct, so that's a possibility as well. These bile ducts are only really very thin, but again, because they're fluid-filled, they're anechoic, so this is actually 
the duct just in through here and you can see our little measurement just here. This is the gallbladder above and the little bit of liver around. So this here is the duct which we've measured and you can see it's about um, four millimetres so it's only very, very thin. When we do our measurement, it depends whether the patient has a gallbladder or the gallbladder has been removed. If they still have a gallbladder, then the common bile duct should measure less than six millimetres. If it's over six millimetres, we've got a dilated duct and we have to go looking for the reason why. If they've had their gallbladder removed, then the bile duct becomes a bit dilated up become, because it comes a bit of a storage space. So what we say is if they've had a, the gallbladder remover or cholecystectomy, if it's less than 10 millimetres, we consider that normal. Again, if it's greater than the 10 millimetres, we're going and there could be something going on, it could be um, blocked, let's go looking for the reason why. Now the gallbladder, big empty fluid filled sac, so it should look anechoic, it should have a thin hyperechoic or whitish um, thin wall around it. We do measure the wall and it should be less than three millimetres. If it's over three millimetres, then the wall's thick, dilated, we've got an unhappy gallbladder. So if we look at this picture just here, the gallbladder can make out it looks like a pear. Okay, neck up this end here, and this is the fundus, the dependent end down here. So this is the longitudinal image if we're standing erect. And you can see we've taken a measurement just here of the thin wall, and this is all liver just here. Anechoic fluid field should just look like a big black pear. In, long, in transverse, it looks roundish, oblongish. Um, and again, just nice and anechoic inside. And as we talked about before, the fasting is important. To see the gallbladder like that, your patient has to be fasted. If they've eaten, it will have contracted and all that black anechoic fluid will be lost. The other thing we do do when we're looking at the gallbladder is we always look at the gallbladder with the patient erect as well. So we do it with them lying supine, lying in the left posterior oblique position. But for stones, we want to, and in, in everyone we do it, but particularly if they've got stones, we want to stand them erect. And when you stand them erect, what happens is you'll see the stones move. Often they'll be up here in the neck and you'll see them float and bump down and then when they're erect, they'll sit down here in the fundus. And that's important when we're looking at stones. We need to say, are the stones mobile and moving or are the stones impacted at the neck? If they're impacted at the neck, they need to go to theatre urgently, relatively. If they're sitting down here and floating around and happy, then um, it's, yes, probably still need to get your gallbladder out, but we can plan it and it can be months um, down the track. So it's not quite so urgent. All right, so now let's look at some pathologies. Let's look at some abnormal um, things in these structures that we've looked at in the scan. A liver cysts look like cysts anywhere in the body. You can have one, you can have multiples. They're always going to be fluid filled and therefore anechoic. You should be able to see the periphery of them, their margins. They shouldn't look like they're invading or affecting the tissue around them. And often you can see the posterior enhancement behind them because they're fluid filled. So the arrow on this image here is pointing to that posterior enhancement, which is quite obvious on this cyst. Sometimes you can get um, bleeds into them and infections in them, and then they'll have debris, echogenic, bright, floaty things in them. When they look like that, we tend to worry about them more than if they just look anechoic and what we call a simple cyst. And sometimes we do therefore need to um, do CTs on them, um, contrast to see if they're vascular, or sometimes stick a needle into them to get some, some cells out to make sure that they're not something nasty. Now, this is a common one, you're going to come across this a lot, fatty infiltration of the liver. 
This is commonly seen in people whose liver function tests are abnormal, who have high cholesterol or who are alcoholics. This is what you'll start to see. Can be caused by other things as well, such as if they've got contracted hepatitis, um, if they've got diabetes, and some medications can result in fatty livers. And what's happening is just because the liver's filtering the blood, it's fi filtering out the fats in the blood and it's storing them in the liver. But that's enlarging the liver and meaning the liver can't function and work as well because it's got all these fats in it. Again, the liver, a very forgiving organ. If we can um, reverse what's ever causing this, so if we can um, drop down the alcohol use, if we can get the cholesterol levels down to normal, if we can put the patient on a diet um, and get their weight under control, the liver will um, dispose of these fats and go back to normal size and, and normal function and look much better. So how do we know we've got a fatty liver? And, and these can be sort of mild, moderate to quite severe. Um, just depending on the patient and, and where they are. But the obvious thing that you will notice is on this picture here, we've got the liver, and then this is the kidney. Now, when you look at this picture, you sort of go, oh, that's a really dark kidney. All right, now the kidney is normal. What's abnormal is the liver, and it's looking more echogenic or more hyperechoic than the renal cortex. Remember, they should look isoechoic or the same. So it's looking very hyperechoic or brighter than the renal cortex because it's got fat deposited in it, okay, and it's unhappy and their liver function tests would be abnormal. With this one here, this is the kidney just here and this is all of the liver. Look how much larger this liver looks. Here's the diaphragm here in comparison to the kidney. So you can see this one, it's probably not quite so enlarged. It sort of looks more a normal size. With this one, again, the kidney's normal, but we've got this huge enlarged liver. Now, the other thing you'll notice about the liver is see how it looks bright and hyperechoic here in comparison to the renal cortex, and then it just goes black. This is attenuation. It's black because the sound wave can't get through here. It can't send a signal back. So the machine's getting no signal at all back from this area, so it just denotes that it's black. So we're only really seeing the liver tissue to about here. And then the sound wave is completely absorbed or scattered. So we're not getting any information back. So this is severe attenuation. And this is worse. This is a far worse and sicker liver. It's enlarged, it's got massive attenuation, and no matter what we do, we're not going to see to the back of that liver. We're just not going to see it. So anything mass could be hiding in here. But this liver is a much sicker liver than the liver above, just here. But both can be reversed if we can find out what's causing this. Fix that problem, the liver will forgive. Now, cavernous hemangiomas are also very, very common. Usually they're singular, but sometimes you can have multiples. And these are benign, they're nothing to worry about. We've usually, persons usually had them all their life and they're just a mass of blood vessels that are formed and usually the blood's clotted off within them. So if I was to put colour Doppler on it, we wouldn't get any blood flow within them. This is again, generally speaking. So because they've got clotted blood in them, they are hyperechoic, they're brighter. But if we look at them, they um, are well circumscribed around the outside, so they don't look like they're out invading the tissue and we've got no tissue reaction around them. So we would look at that and go, hemangioma, but let's follow it up in six months' time and make sure that it hasn't grown. If it's grown, then suddenly we go CTing and contrast CTs and thinking nasty things. But generally speaking, hemangiomas, they've been there all your life, they don't change, um, they're more just an incidental finding and don't cause you any trouble. 
Now, liver metastases, on the other hand, cause lots of problems. These patients are obviously going to have a previous history of having had ca primary cancer somewhere else. And often we see them when um, they start to get sick, their liver function tests will be off, they're feeling lethargic, and often their abdomen can be a bit distended because they could have ascites or free fluid within their abdomen. So metastases, we get multiple lesions within the liver. So if we're just seeing one, we tend to think primary tumour. If we're seeing multiples, we're thinking metastases and secondary tumours. And the tumours do look different depending on where the primary cancer has been. But a common appearance is this halo appearance. And what is causing the halo is the anechoic circle around the outside which is fluid so that's just a dematous reaction to the cancer that's growing within the liver so we're getting reaction from the tissue causing that halo around the outside so sometimes the multiples grow all together to form big masses and sometimes they say sort of a singular little masses but now you can see that the liver tissue doesn't look homogenous and the same it looks very patchy, it's got bright areas, it's got dark areas, it's got black areas, so it's not homogenous. And that's the classic metastasy appearance of the liver. Now, I love this word, it's an unusual word, but cholidocolithiasis is actually just means stones within the bile ducts. So cholidocolithiasis, stones within the bile ducts. So when we see um, the gallbladder, the gallbladder may have stones in it or it may not. The person could have right upper quadrant pain. The stones could have actually moved from the gallbladder into the bile duct and it's that moving process through the cystic duct into the common bile duct that has caused the pain and potential blockage as they've gone along. So they look, the stones look the same as they do in the bile duct, they're echogenic. Um, if you roll the patient, you will see them often, you can get them to move within the bile duct and they often do cause obstruction. So you'll have a dilated bile duct when you actually um, measure it. And depending on how long they've been uh, causing the obstruction, you can get the IHD dilatation, which means intrahepatic duct dilatation, which means that the ducts within the liver can be dilated up. And we usually don't see those, remember? So if we're seeing them, we've got a long-standing major obstruction. And also remember to look for stones still back in the gallbladder as well. So on this picture, the yellow arrow, is pointing to the stones. So we've got two rather large stones and you can see the size of this duct. It's quite larger to an image we looked at earlier. And this here is the gallbladder. On this image, this is the gallbladder here. Again, the duct is a lot bigger than what we saw on those original um, pictures that we looked at. And the arrow is pointing just here to the stones, just here. Sometimes you'll get shadowing off the stones if they're sort of big and full of calcium. This one is basically sitting and stuck at the head of the pancreas. So that's where they'll often get stuck. This head of pancreas will come in here and they can't, they're too big to duck in behind the head of pancreas. So if they're not there and they have ducked in behind, and they'll be sitting down at this second part of the joint and I'm trying to get out. But we may not see them. So if we see a dilated duct, as I said, rolling the patient may get the stones to move along the duct. Uh, but even if I see a dilated duct and I can't find the reason why, I'm going to go, oh, there's got to be something going on down that end where I can't see. Okay, so it's just about saying what you can and you can't see an ultrasound, knowing your limitations. Now, cholelithiasis of the gallbladder just means stones within the gallbladder. And we need to differentiate between cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. When we have cholecystitis, the itis meaning inflammation. So when we've got cholecystitis, the gallbladder wall is inflamed. There might be fluid in the area, which is referred to as pericholecystic fluid. The patient will be sick, they'll often have a fever and a temperature um, and be feeling really off colour and have pain. And 
with a cholecystitis, the gallbladder needs to come out relatively urgently, but they because of the infection, they can't instantly take the patient to theatre. So they actually, with cholecystitis, have to put the patient on a course of the antibiotics, fix up the infection, and then go in and remove the gallbladder. If we have cholelithiasis, which is just stones within the gallbladder, they're just sitting there in the gallbladder. They're not worrying the gallbladder, irritating the wall. It's not infected. It may become infected in years to come, but at the moment it's, you know, everything's working properly and it's happy. So with the cholelithiasis, as I said, you can plan to have your gallbladder taken out, you know, three months, six months, 12 months, however long the waiting list is to get um, the gallbladder removed, whereas your cholecystitis is more an urgent um, situation. The stones can be really tiny to rather large. So all of these pictures here are rather large um, calcium stones. And you can see on this top one, the lovely shadow in behind it. But this is just cholelithiasis. We've got a nice thin hyperechoic wall around this gallbladder. This one down here, you can see that the wall's actually really thick and it's got a hypoechoic component around the outside. So all of that is the thickened wall all the way around caused by this stone here with its shadowing. So this is a cholecystitis. The gallbladder is infected and unhappy. With this one, we've got a stone in the neck of the gallbladder with its shadow. All of this is wall, okay, so it's really quite thick. And see how contracted down the gallbladder looks in comparison to the ones above. It looks a lot smaller. So it's smaller because the bile can't get in there. So what I would say is that this stone is impacted in the neck of the gallbladder. It's not moving, it's stuck there. And so the fluid can't get in. And every time this patient eats, the gallbladder is going to contract to send this bile down. But it'll push some past the stone. But can you imagine how painful that will be when the, this person eats, particularly if they eat something really fatty, the gallbladder is going to be contracting, trying to push this fluid out and they're going to get severe pain. And that would very much be like heart attack pain. So we would do an erect, stand this patient erect, and how would we know it was impacted because it wouldn't move? If we stand them erect, we would expect all of these stones to head down to the bottom to the fundus. So this one won't move. Again, they need to go to theatre to get all this removed. However, we need to get them on antibiotics and reduce the infection first. So again, this is cholecystitis, but even worse than the patient above because of the impacted stone. Now, pancreas pathology. Adenocarcinomas, I have seen quite a few. There's certainly been some um, celebrity people who have died of pancreatic cancers. There's not a lot, unfortunately, they can do for pancreatic cancers. And often when we pick them up, they have already metastasized to the liver. Um, yeah, particularly if off the body or the tail of the pancreas, they've just got so much room to grow in that they don't cause an obstruction, so we don't pick them up early, so they'll have metastasized. If they're in the head, like this picture just here, um, this one is just here, this hypoechoic round area, it's only tiny. Um, and they're showing this dilated pancreatic duct. So it's dilating up the pancreatic duct of this patient. Um, the SB is your splenic vein and the um, superior mesenteric vein is just um, there. So often if they're in the head, we pick them up earlier because they cause obstruction. So the jaw patient will come with jaundice because it's often compressing not only the pancreatic duct but affecting the common bile duct and the biliary system as well. So often they're smaller in the head before they've metastasized, so we pick them up earlier. If they're off bodies and tails, they can get quite large and have metastasized before we get to the patient. Um, so just inhomogeneous mass within the pancreas can be anywhere um, causing some compression symptoms. Splenomegaly we've already talked about. Um, it means an enlarged 
uh, spleen. So oftentimes you won't be able to find why, but it's important to make sure that there isn't a mass within the spleen that's making it enlarged. It could be that they have a blood problem that's causing the spleen to become enlarged. So if we look at this picture here, see how this spleen has lost its nice C shape? It's really fat and chubby and look how small the kidney looks here. It's really being dwarfed by the spleen where before it sort of sat nicely in with the spleen. So this one we'd measure from one end to the other but on the scale here you can see we're at about 18 centimetres so we would need to do a volume um, to work out. So look for the reason why we might have an enlarged spleen, but don't panic if you can't find a reason why. Now with your trauma patients, um, as we talked about earlier, particularly if they've got rib fractures, um, they're going to be worried about the spleen and whether the spleen is ruptured, particularly if their blood pressure is low and they can't stabilise them. Now many of you who are interested in trauma may have seen peritoneal lavages done where they actually run some saline fluid into the peritoneal cavity and then they drain the fluid off and if the fluid is blood stained they take the patient straight to theatre because what they're assuming is that the spleen has ruptured. These days they actually do a lot of places, a lot of emergency departments have ultrasound machines in the emergency department and so with the ultrasound they do a quick look for free fluid within the abdomen and have a quick look at the spleen to see if it has um, ruptured. So, which is great because it's a lot less invasive procedure for and quicker for the patient than a peritoneal lavage. Now, the with the splenic rupture, the spleen has a capsule around it. So the can be contained within the capsule so the capsule doesn't break or the capsule can break and then we get the blood out into the peritoneum as well. So there are four different types of um, splenic ruptures and it depends which one the patient has as to how what they do and how they monitor it. But in the majority of cases, um, if we've got a splenic rupture, the patient will go to theatre and have the spleen removed. It also depends on how long since the trauma as to what the spleen is going to look like and what I suppose the blood or the bleeding is going to look like. So you've got to think about um, the whole clotting system of blood. So if the trauma has just happened, then the blood is going to be anechoic okay, and black. If the trauma was say, you know, they fell off their motorbike, you know, 24 to 48 hours ago um, and were worried that their spleen would be ruptured, well, the clotting process will have started within that blood in the spleen. So because of the clot and the debris that starts to clump together, what actually happens is the blood starts to look the same as the spleen. So it looks isoechoic or the same. And it'll look therefore hard to see but you'll have of, often a strange shaped sleep spleen and it will be enlarged. You may or may not have have ascites depending on whether it's ruptured. Then as clotting process happens what happens then is it then becomes the body becomes necrotic and it breaks it down so it becomes then some solid bits and some fluid bits in it which is the normal clotting um, resolution process. So then it has solid and cystic parts to it, so solid and fluid parts to it once we get over the 48 hours. Now let's look at some pictures. On this first picture here, this is the spleen just here. Now it does have a nice C shape to it, um, but here it looks a lot thicker than here. The big thing about it is it's not homogenous in the same. We've got darker anechoic areas within it. So this is actually ruptured. Within, it hasn't ruptured the capsule, but we have got some bleeding within the spleen. On this one here, this is all of the splenic tissue, all here. So we've lost our C shape and then we look like we've got a real round mass here. So this would be greater than the 48 hours where we're starting to get um, necrotic breakdown of the clot. So you can see the blood looks isoechoic to the splenic tissue. 
that's because it's clotted, but then the body's starting to break it down so it becomes a bit cystic in the middle. So again, in homogenous looking funny shaped spleen, if we measured it, it would be enlarged and um, it's not inhomogeneous. On this one, it's um, actually hard to work out where the spleen is, but it's here. This is the spleen here. Again, this is an older um, clot. It's starting to break down. We've got anechoic bits and um, some sort of debris bits as well. And this is probably all that's left of normal splenic tissue just here. On this one, this is the normal splenic tissue here. And then we've got the H is the hemorrhage on the side. So it's sort of like in two halves um, like we've got a fluid level just here and you can see it's anechoic and got some debris in it so it is starting um, to clot um, so again nasty looking spleen so pretty much all of these patients I would imagine they'd all end up going to theatre and having the spleen out again we can um, live without our spleen the big thing um, for adults if they lose their spleen is their immunity because it does have um, a role in B cell, I think it's B cell production, which helps with our immunity. So they have to be very careful about their immune system and, and they'd be more prone to catching bugs. But we can live without it and certainly if it's bleeding, um, it, it, it's a problem. Now here's our abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, anything greater than three centimetres, as I said, we're going to be thinking surgery. But what we're looking for in the longitudinal position is as we come down, instead of the aorta being nice and straight, we come down and it bulges out. And that's because the wall has become weakened. And on this one, you can see it's, say, 3.3 millimetres. So it's just over. So this, they'd be starting to go and see a vascular surgeon and talking about what they can actually do to stop it getting any bigger. So sometimes the wall just becomes weak and we get a bulge. Other times what happens is the wall splits and blood goes down in between the split of the wall. Now once it's done this and it's split the wall, it weakens the wall greatly and so it increases the chance of rupture happening. So we get what we call a true and a false lumen. So we still have a true anechoic lumen that the blood will be going through and then this is the false lumen which has clotted off blood within it. Okay, so again that's weakened the wall. This one needs to go to theatre um, to support that wall. This one here, here's our true lumen. And then all around the periphery is a false lumen with clotted bud. So on this, the whole um, inner lining has separated and come forward. And between the inner and outer lining, blood has gotten down in there and clotted off. So very weakened aorta just there. So that needs a, a tension. So we can have a dissecting aneurysm, which dissects or separates the linings of the wall or we can just have um, a fusiform outpouching of the aorta where the whole wall is just bulge. Both weaken um, the wall and make it more prone to rupture, um, but the dissecting is worse than the other type. Now, when we look at our blood flow in an aneurysm, the red blood cells tend to um, lose their direction a little bit and flow in different ways and they say that the flow becomes turbulent because they've been coming down a nice straight tube and then they come into this bigger area like a big swimming pool and they all shoot into there and go yippee and get a bit confused and swirl around so they lose their direction um, and where they're going a little bit when we have aneurysms so blood flow to the periphery say legs and things like that can be affected with people who have an aneurysm. That's something else we look for when we're doing our ultrasound. Now, renal cysts just look the same as cysts anywhere, um, cysts in the liver. They can come from the cortex, the outside of the kidney or the inner medulla. So again, they're going to look anechoic, um, nice, smooth, well-defined walls with your posterior enhancement. Particularly, you'll see that if they're big. 
um, can have one, can have multiples. Generally, they're nothing to worry about unless we've got, an, again, an infection or a bleed into them, and therefore they're seen as a complex cyst, then we're going to worry and want to put a needle into them. Sometimes people need to get them drained because they do get quite large and they can create pressure effects um, within their abdomen, which can be uncomfortable. But generally speaking, they're nothing to worry about in the incidental findings. This is the kidney here, and then this is a really large cyst just here. Here's another kidney here, and it's got a few cysts on it. And this one here is polycystic kidney disease. See how it's really hard to discern the cortex and the medulla of the kidney, and we've got multiple large cysts and that is polycystic disease. So the kidney won't function as well and the patient will start having going into basically renal failure. And these people need to have down the track uh, renal transplants um, to keep their bodies going. So the massive kidney tissue disappears and they end up with just a massive cyst and the large, and this will be huge in their tummy. So they often end up with a dilated tummy. Now, hydronephrosis of the kidneys, you've probably heard about um, with other modalities. You can have a dilatation of the, just the pelvis or the pelvis up into the calocele system. So it really depends on what the obstruction is, where it is, and how long it's been there for. So we can classify this again as mild, moderate, or quite um, severe. Go looking for why. We may not always find the reason why. Have we got a mass pushing on it? Is there a stone causing an obstruction? Is there something going on down in the pelvis, the bladder, the uterus, the prostate? Go looking for why. Often on ultrasound, you won't find why. Um, they'll have to go for a CT to try and find the reason why. But on our pictures here, this is the outer cortex of the kidney and we can see the anechoic dilated up um, renal pelvis starting up into the calyces. So this is probably a moderate and this one's down here is quite a severe one. So we can see the pelvis right up into the calyceal um, pyramids up in the cortex. So um, that's more of severe hydronephrosis. So it needs further investigating why that has happened. Now stones within the kidney. Generally, stones can sit in the kidney and cause no pain, no problems. It's when they move, and when they move, they cause pain. And often, because they scrape the wall of the vessel that they're in, um, they can cause bleeding. So the patient may notice some blood within their urine. Um, very painful um, kidney stones. They can these days blast them with a high intensity ultrasound beam. They do it in uh, theatre and they shatter the stone into multiple little pieces with the thought that then they can pass those little pieces through. Sometimes if they're really big they will go in and actually operate and cut stones out. So anyone could have a stone, we wouldn't know about it until it started to move. So generally speaking, the little yellow arrows here are pointing to the echogenic structures with the shadowing behind the stones. Here's one here, echogenic structure with its little shadow coming down. And here's another one here, and you can see this one's starting to create an obstruction of the pelvis, and it's quite a big one and it's shadow behind it. The key is, if you find one, look for the second and this really applies to anything you do in anything that you're imaging in any modality if you find one pathology look for the second pathology if you find the second pathology look for the third pathology don't make assumptions because this patient just here see this stone here with the shadow um, we could assume that their pain was from this stone all right but it actually wasn't See here, this is the ureter coming out from the kidney, which uh, is a bit dilated. Don't usually see a uh, ureter like this. On this patient, when I went down to the bladder, they had another stone sitting at the bottom of the ureter waiting to push into the bladder. And it was that stone that was moving and causing them all the problems. This stone up in the kidney was just another incidental finding that may one day decide to move and cause them troubles, but it was the one down at the bladder 
that was their trouble. So don't make assumptions, find one, look for the second. Okay, remember that in everything that you do from general x-ray all the way through. So just to finish off um, the upper abdomen, what's ultrasound good for? Where does it fit within the modalities? So for the pancreas, as we talked about, because we often can't see it because of the stomach and gas in the stomach, it's not great. It's not going to be a modality of choice for looking at the pancreas might be all right for having a quick look but if you think there's something in the pancreas you really need to be doing a say a CT. For the gallbladder and the biliary system it's extremely good and would be your modality of choice for first port of call. So you wouldn't go irradiating a person and giving them radiation dose from a CT if you thought they had stones in their gallbladder or biliary system. It, you would go for an ultrasound. As with anything, any structures anywhere, it's really good for determining whether the, a mass is solid or cystic. So is it fluid filled or is it more a, a mass and potentially um, a tumour? And if we can see a lesion on, C, on ultrasound, even if it's been found on MRI or CT, the best way to follow it up, if we can see it, is with ultrasound because we're not using a radiation. So if we've got a mass, say, found on CT in the liver, but we think it's benign, it's better, much better to follow it up in six and 12 months with an ultrasound than following it up with CTs. Um, patients who go to their GP, it's a really good initial look for um, your abnormal blood tests with your liver functions and for any pain, particularly right upper quadrant because we're not using the radiation. We get a good overview of the main abdominal structures and organs. And um, the other benefit is then if we find something, you can then customize, say your CT or your MRI scan. So you can do your finer slices through your pancreas. You can do your finer slices through the liver. You can time your injections to show the arteries or the veins or the kidneys or the liver um, so that you're getting better benefit out of those next tests that you're doing. So it's a really good, quick, general let's have a look and see what's going on with your tummy and then we'll take it from there. It's a very very handy examination for the abdomen.